I'm very excited to be here sharing with you. This is my PhD research. At the moment, I am writing my dissertation. And what we have here um, is a study on the translation of Kirtan in the Americas, mostly United States, Canada, and Brazil, but it applies also to other parts of the Western world. And the title says Music and Spirituality in a Transcultural Whirlpool. So I'm really trying to focus on the translation, on the encounter of cultures, how ideas and practices from India, they come to the West, they are adopted and adapted by people in the Americas. We see in the image, the Bhakti Fest poster, that's a famous festival that has been going on for, for more than a decade. And, and we see people from different groups there, Kirtanias, Kirtan singers from different groups, all together on the stage. And there's the motto, be in the bhav, which means be in the mood, let the, the Kirtan mood, let the the mood of chanting the divine names and, and mantras, let that pervade you. So this is just to illustrate like one of the main festivals in North America where people are uh, participating in Kirtan. So, but let me first give you a brief introduction about what Kirtan means. And those who are not familiar with the word, Kirtan from, comes from the Sanskrit kirt, which means to celebrate, to praise, to glorify. And it appears in, in, in the sacred literature, for example, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Purana. Uh, they'll discuss and emphasize kirtan, which in that context means to speak about, to make famous, to describe, to glorify, and to spread the message of God. So later on, the, the word kirtan assumes a connotation of music and it becomes a very important instrument in the bhakti movements. So it's the very pulsating heart of the bhakti movements in medieval India. It's a way for the bhakti poets and saints not only to express their devotion, but also to, to spread their message. Many of these poets, they will write poems, devotional poems, which encapsulate the essence of their message. And this is how the, the Bhakti uh, movement spread. We have um, Chaitanya uh, in, in West Bengal and then like spreading from the, the region called Gauda. He's, he travels around India and his movement spreads in North India and in, in Northeastern India. And we have in the Punjab Guru Nanak founding Sikh, uh, the Sikh Pant, and, and so many other Bhakti movements in India, right? So, so all of them are drawing from ideas of sacred sound in the Vedas, and these ideas they pervade Indian thought. But then, after expanding in India, this practice of Kirtana goes beyond Indian borders and today becomes a transnational and transcultural event. So Kirtan is adopted and adapted by people from all walks of life. And that's the focus of my research is actually looking at how people who are not originally from India, who have no Indian background, how are these people adopting Kirtan? What kind of adaptations they make? And why are they interested? Uh, what's the motivation, the appeal Kirtan has for this kind of people? So the, the idea is to, to look at how an ancient practice and how this whole ideology of sacred sound gets translated in the West. And to see the effect of that, how Kirtan is coloring the words religious soundscape. And here I am playing with the words coloring, which is more of a visual metaphor, and also the soundscape instead of landscape to emphasize the 
the sound uh, emphasis given in India. So I'm not trying to make any stereotype or, or play with Orientalist tropes, but, but there is a, a, a very strong focus and emphasis on sound in India. Anyone who has been to India knows that uh, sound plays a key role. So many times I saw people saying, I'm going to read a book, and they start reciting. And in the past, that it was even more common. So whereas in the, in the West, people can just look silently at the pages of a book, right? And that would be the most normal way of reading a book. Another thing that I, I found very curious when I lived in India was that people would sometimes get a new car and just break off the, the mirrors on the side think they are useless because why do you need mirrors if, if other cars are going to be using the, the horn anyway to inform you that they are approaching. So there is a very strong sense of hearing and there are scholars like Guy Beck and uh, Howard Coward who have been emphasizing this sonic aspect of religion in India, which is so important. So uh, what, I, what I have been doing to, to study this translation of Kirtan in the West is to first look at the theological foundations. It's so important to understand that even though Kirtan is very emotional, is an expression of bhakti, of devotion, but it has a very solid and very refined theological foundations, which come since the Vedas and ideas of sound and consciousness and how sound actually equates consciousness so there's a very interesting, uh, there are many studies on that. And so looking at how those ideas go from the Vedas to um, so many other Indian uh, wisdom traditions like Vedanta, Mimansa, the grammarians, the yoga traditions and Tantra and the theistic traditions and Bhakti. And then Kirtan has all that information to draw from. And then looking at how different vectors of transmission, like immigration, the counterflow of colonization, colonialism, um, which basically means Indian people using all the resources that, that the British took to India. They, they brought the English language, they brought the press and modern institutions, and they take all of that and they bring it back to the West. And when immigration is open, so many Indian gurus, they go to the US and they start their movements using those same tools to, to propagate Indian ideas. And not only that, Westerners, Americans, young Americans and Europeans, they are going to India sometimes even by foot or hitchhiking, and, and they are learning about Kirtan and bringing it back to, to the West. So we have um, Krishna Das, Jayutal, and so many others who, who have done that process. And we also have celebrities like the Beatles, especially George Harrison, who, who promotes Kirtan in unprecedented ways and really gets it to, to become like a house war, house, household word. So uh, then we have networks and patterns of propagation, looking at how the yoga movement opens space for Kirtan to, to, to follow that network and how mindfulness also gives some, some patterns of transformation and adaptations to make Kirtan become portable and intelligible and attractive to people in the West. And also looking into the online Kirtan events during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's so much going on. It was hard to, to keep track of them. I was doing my research during that time and a part of the research was to, to, to take nine online courses on Kirtan done by different groups so people like krishna das jayutal david newman and so many others they gave online courses making adaptations to teach people how to to sing and play instruments and understand the the ideas of sacred sound through online courses also academic courses the oxford center for for hindu studies promoted a course with uh, dr guy beck which I, I had the opportunity to take and so a lot of, of online research was going on. Uh, many events like for the COVID, so many groups in ISKCON and Hare Krishna movement and other groups even, they were promoting Kirtan events 
sometimes for hours or days or weeks or months and it was really amazing to, to be able to participate in some of these events so brought kirtan to a new dimension of of um yeah online um performance just okay and the focus then of the research is really the transculturation understand how kirtan is becoming a new music genre is not anymore just the traditional the, what has been done in india but is also not just Western music. It's a fusion. It's a, a meeting point in which uh, elements from both cultures, they, they come together and they generate a new kind of music. Um, of course, there are issues of cultural appropriation, which is more complicated than I thought at, at the beginning. There are, um, yes, there are dangers, there are problems there, but there are also opportunities. And, and yeah, so it's, I can't really go into the, the details of that here, but but it's an important consideration. And, and one also important point is that those who are trying to preserve traditional and heritage kirtan often find out that the preservation can happen through adaptation, through meaningful and knowledgeable adaptation by those who understand the, the, the process of kirtan, those who understand tradition, who understand ragas and Indian music, but then find ways to express that in new forms with new musical instruments in, for a new public. And one uh, point in my research is also making a contrast with the Brazilian scenario, because much of what has been written on Kirtan has been from a musicological point of view and in mostly in Europe and North America. So I find that Brazil, which is my place of origin, it has a, a oh, something have, interesting. Sorry, Gustavo, you have two and a half more minutes. Okay, thank okay. you. So Brazil has a, an interesting contribution because there are ancient links like between Brazil and India since colonial times. There is a connection there. The Portuguese were going to India, bringing things from India to Brazil, not only artifacts and clothes and, and but also food and plants and all kinds of, of things and Brazilians would be looking forward for the Portuguese to come with new things from India so they had this positive attitude and they were colonized just like India so like they're both colonized by Europeans they're, they're not feeling that we are the colonizers and they are the colonized right so it's a different way of receiving things from India in Brazil at the same time, there is a very small population, so people don't see Indians very often. And because of that, I guess, much more romantic expectations and, and, and views about India. So the way people receive and interact and, and accept and dialogue with Indian ideas in a way that, that is different from North America and Europe. So I'm trying to, to make a comparison and, and show how uh, there is so much transformation on in the Brazilian musical genre. They, they even call Brazilian devotional music. It's a new style of music, or they call by different names as well, like that we could translate as healing music or, or prayer music. And all that adds to, to the experience of Kirtan in new ways in this dialogue between India and people in the West. Okay, so this is a very general outline of my dissertation, which is still under, the pro I'm still writing it. And I was just excited to share with you this research, which tries to go to bring more to the, the theological aspect of sacred sound, first of all, and then historical movements, and also the ethnographic research, trying to understand why and how people have been engaging with this practice of singing the divine names and poems and and sacred texts and so on.